Hello folks, welcome back to The Knowledge. Yep, it's Friday and the Watch Your Meta team is back to help provide the knowledge for you guys. Continuing on the same vein that we've been over the last two or three weeks, we're going to keep continually looking at recovery. We've previously spoke about nutritional recovery, we talked about sleep and how important that is. Today we're going to talk about self-care and how to look after yourself right now, considering that you're not able probably to get to your own normal physio or get to our lady in the screen, Carol Andrews, for some great therapy. Carol, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Um, not so happy now it's raining, but yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's certainly taken a wee bit of a turn over the last few days, but it's been great when it's uh, it's been here, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So on this conversation, uh, we're continuing here, Carol, on, on recovery. One of the one of the big things that I did an awful lot of uh, as an athlete was find niggles whether it was crashes or whether it was just traveling or whether it was sleeping badly. One of my one of my favorite places when I was an athlete was the physio table and just lying there and getting fixed. Now, obviously right now with the whole, what, what's going on right now, it's very, very difficult for a practices to be working, very difficult for you to do what you do in your day to day, which is ultimately help and fix niggles and, and put people straight and make sure they're getting better. Uh, from a from a physical aspect as well as a recovery from injury etc or a crash etc so what are the kind of the, the main things that we're kind of looking at obviously if we take the fact that we've got usually people right now there won't be many crashes because most people are riding indoors or running you know everyone's very aware right now we need to stay safe so the sort of things we're looking at recovery tool wise what sort of things do you I mean I've I've used foam rollers, I've used uh, everything up to brutal lacrosse balls and my glutes. There's now percussion guns you can buy. There's Normatec uh, air compression, uh, big fancy legs you can put on yourself. But there's actually some quite really, really simple stuff you can do, which doesn't actually have to cost the earth. And some of those tools we're going to talk about. So what, what's kind of your kind of go-to tools when it look at recovery from, from sessions? If it's been a brutal session, you wake up next day, you've got a wee niggle. What's the sort of things that we should be doing maybe straight after training? And what okay. do they do then the day after as well? Okay, so if we talk about tools, my favourite tool would be a tennis ball. Because a tennis ball is hard, but it's not as hard as a lacrosse ball. Mm. And it's also a little bit giving, so it's a bit squishy as well. Um, and I find that you can, and it's also a good size because foam rollers are sometimes a bit big, although the glute's a big muscle, it's a bit big to get the right angle because it's also quite bony around there. So tennis ball for me would be my go-to, um, or a myofascial release ball, which is slightly bigger than a tennis ball and a bit softer, it's a bit more gentle. Um, and I would use that possibly before, you know, if I've got a niggle in my calf before I go for a run, I can do some what we call trigger point work with my tennis ball. Where I find the little, just gently roll my, my calf over the tennis ball on the floor, find the sore point, and then I just flex and point my foot. And, it, and I go, ah, 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 until it just all softens and relaxes. And that's enough sometimes. Um, there's, there, there's obviously, there's, there's quite a lot of in depth techniques we can go down, but obviously, we, we want to try and keep this as, as, as simple a format as possible for people. But, I agree with you. Tennis ball, good size, and also as it starts to warm up with the tension you're putting through it, the surface area starts getting bigger, which means that you can then work it into the bigger muscle groups, specifically the glutes and the hips, and obviously up and down hamstrings. It's great as well to kind of decompartmentalize your spine as well. Another thing I would, I would do is get two tennis balls and tape them together to make a peanut. And the peanut, yeah. was, peanut is brilliant because it covers an awful lot of... Um, of, of surface area but you can all it's it's incredible how it's just the perfect space between your vertebrae and your back so you can actually <laughs> pull on it yeah regardless of your size <laughs> yeah you can really dial into the little tight bits because for me my um my thoracic spine uh, so behind my my shoulder blades and above is really really tight so i find i spend a lot of time lying on that, rolling around on it, rolling up and down it, and ultimately trying to get my spine to actually bend the way it should be. We're so hungover mm -hmm. nowadays, and cycling specifically, we, if we think about hip flexor and all the usual jargon and mobility that floats about next day, uh, nowadays is because we're in 
not normal human positions. We spend all of our time, we, we wake up from lying potentially in a lousy position. We then come down to our kitchen to sit down in a lousy position, to then sit in front of our box, uh, well, it's a car or a, a cubicle at work or in, in your kitchen. Then we sit on our bike and they're all forward flex movements, which means that the hip gets tight, lower back maybe is unstable. And then it means that whole chain of muscles isn't able to communicate with each other. So when we talk about that, Carol, we, all, we also will talk to further down the line in the conversation about niggles that people will come across. What's the best way that you've found to use, for instance, if we just specifically talk about the good old humble tennis ball, what's, what's the best techniques? Is it literally being quite global with it, moving your muscle around, finding tight spots, or what's the best way you've found to actually use these um, tools? So a couple of things. So like I said about the, the trigger points on the calf, you can do that anywhere, the peanut on the back, anywhere. I personally prefer to do long, slow holding in positions. So, you know, if you were to, to use a foam roller, you know, some people roll up and down, roll their quads up and down the foam roller. To me, that's too quick. So this, without getting too technical, if you start looking at the body rather than separate muscles, but as a complete system encapsulating fascia. Um, and a really simple example would be those plastic bags you used to get that you could fill with water and put in the freezer and it would make ice cubes. Well, the fascia is the plastic bag and the ice cubes would be the muscles. Yeah. So if you go quickly, you'll affect the muscle, but you're going too quickly to affect the fascia. So I, some, I often say to people that the, um, the muscles like to be poked and prodded. So your spiky balls are good for that. If you feel it's a, a kind of specific muscle niggle, you can do that. But the fascia likes to be caressed. It likes to be treated a bit more gently, a bit slower, a bit softer. Um, there's a, I know you do the, the psoas release a particular technique that, I mean, we could do a wee video of if anybody wants. Um, and it works best if you do it slowly. And as you just keep the tennis ball on one area, not with too much pressure, just enough that you can feel it, you'll feel everything ease and almost like it just relaxes and you can feel the body go, ah. Yeah. And then you can just go a bit deeper and a bit deeper. And there's so research has been done on the fascia. They, they can now get these little nano cameras underneath the skin and they can see the tissue changing. So if you put a tennis ball, for example, on your calf, roll on the floor, you sit your calf on top of it, find a sore point and you just sit there for 20, 30, 40 seconds, however long, until it feels soft. All of the tissue from the skin to the bone will be affected. Okay. Yeah. If you go really quickly, and there's nothing wrong with going really quickly, that's just a different technique you won't have that same effect through all the tissue. So, so if we were to use this in a sort of a, a pre and a post session or exercise kind of format, Carol, yeah. is it better time to use either technique? Is it better to use a foam roller before you exercise or after or different techniques? Or is it better to maybe look at the trigger points from using a, a, a smaller object, likes of your, your tennis ball, spiky ball or peanut? What's yeah kind of the, the kind of thought process right now because I know the research changes all the time. All the time, <laughs> yeah. You know, one year it's don't do this, the next year it's do that. <laughs> you know? um, I would say beforehand you want something that's short and sharp and to the point. So the little trigger points on the calf would be perfect. The slower stuff you want to do afterwards or in between sessions. Yeah. You know, when you're trying to, to work on niggles. And you know, you were talking, for example, about the pain that you get, the tightness in your thoracic, and those two tennis balls as a peanut, perfect. You can lie on the floor, go against a wall, lots of different things you can do, but also you need to work on the front. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we often focus on the bit that's sore, and we forget that the bit that's sore is often just a chain of events or a repetitive um, habit that we have. You know, and sometimes unless you follow somebody about, you won't know exactly what it is. 
I mean, you've described your day, so I've got a pretty good idea. Um, but you know, if you're, like you say, we sit at the desk, we're in the kitchen, we're making our food, we're on our bikes, we're out running, everything is here and forward. Yep. This all gets tight and locked, so we need to mobilize, but we also need to open up here. You know, essentially, our bodies were made to move. They weren't made to sit in one position. So you'll probably hear me say a lot through this interview that the best thing to do is just move. Very true. And I think, especially being from a cycling point of view, if you, if you are a cyclist and then say you do start running, or even if you're doing a triathlon and you're doing an Ironman, you spend 100 odd miles in that aero position, it's mm -hmm. going to take you a bit of time to migrate out of ultimately uh, an incredibly forward flex position where you're rounded at the shoulders, the head's tucked in, you're trying to keep aerodynamic and you're there for anything up to six, seven hours, depending on how quick you're going. Yeah. Not everyone can be calm worth in doing four hours, you know, it's <laughs> pretty, that's pretty rare, but even then it's still four hours in that position. And if you imagine you're going from one extreme to another extreme, opening up the shoulders, opening up that, to loosen off that lower back, but more importantly, the angle at which your, your hip has been sitting for like hours totally changes. So you go from being this really closed hip to having a really open hip where your leg is actually behind you for the majority of the time you're running. So you're doing that with your hip angle. That's a massive, massive difference. And, and that's where I think a lot of people can come undone when they are maybe a cyclist who's taken up running as a bit of cross training and something. And the first things you always hear is that, oh, my hip feels really sore and my glute's not firing or their calves get really sore because the feet they come down they're not used to having that sort of um that angle in their the the, the sort of the angle which are that your foot actually rests in and loading that ankle as much as well so that pulls all the fascia you spoke about from the yeah. foot the, and the achilles tendon and that whole sort of heel cord area that gets really really gummed up and we find that a lot of people when they do just use a tennis ball, even a smaller mile fascia ball, which I, I know you, you've had plenty of them lying about the clinic. Just roll yeah. your foot, getting working on your calf, just releasing all that tension out of that area actually means that you're actually a, be able to run better and you're giving yourself way more range of movement to play with, aren't you? Yeah. I think the other thing that needs to go along with that is, you know, I mean, we hear everywhere, oh, your glutes aren't firing. Well, they are, you know, but the body's very, the body's really clever. And if you're, say, like your example, you're a cyclist, you spent all these years doing your cycling, your body's become really, really good at doing that well. Yeah. And then you say to it, now what we're going to do is we're going to do this running thing. Oh. I would like to do that quite well as well. But the, the, the muscles in the legs are made for cycling. Yeah. yeah. In this example, not for everyone. And often what happens, when you start to run, as the body adapts or as it learns that this new skill, it defaults to the muscles that it can call on to do the job. And that's often the calf. So as well as you getting this new movement with the foot, you know, and all of this, this tension, the calf gets tight because the calf is doing a lot of the work for the running. So this is where band work comes in really well. So it's another tool. Um, all different types of bands, but um, you know, you put the band around your thighs, you do sideway, like little sideway steps, we like to call them crab walks or monster walks, um, walking forward and back. And all that does is it helps to, to, to wake the muscles up that you want to use when you go running. And that should help take the load off the calves. So this is again why it's good to focus on the bits that are sore, but to remember that, you know, even when you run, your shoulders still work. Yeah. You know, it's not just the legs, it's the whole body works. So it's trying to get the body to work well together. Um, Notice when I start getting back into running, that what, I almost feel like somebody's got a dagger in behind my shoulder blade because I'm not used to that movement of my shoulder and my left shoulder is dicky at the best of times. Uh, yeah. yeah. Pick one up when I'm out running, you're just not my right elbow of yours. I'm like, just different. But I always find that it takes me, I almost feel like I've got a stitch in the in the back of my shoulder, but it's not a stitch. It's just purely because I think the the, the fascia and the muscle and the joints are in sort of like the, the, the rear part of my, my rib cage and my spine are just starting to get a bit mobile. And that tends to be like one of the my telltale signs that I've not done enough of that opening up my chest. 
we're yeah. talking up your chest, but we spoke about glutes, we spoke about calves, we spoke about rolling about on a ball and going up and down our spine. But what can we do for anyone here to kind of take away just a, a wee thing that we could probably help them quite a lot? It's a really simple thing. How could you use that tennis ball in the frontal planes to help open up that chest and get rid of that rounded position, which we're so used to being in here, 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 and here? How can yeah. What can yeah. We I mean, you can use it anywhere. You can, you know, the, the pec muscles, you've got, you've got two, two pec muscles. You've got the pec major, which attaches onto the arm, and the, the minor, which attaches onto the front of the shoulder, shoulder blade, um, a little bit that sticks out at the front. And you can stretch both of them with the tennis ball. And again, in the same position, you know, get yourself on the floor and get the tennis ball underneath and just gently apply a bit of pressure. It doesn't have to be all your body weight because that might be quite sore, you know? But my top tip for the shoulders, and I don't laugh, is get your arms up here. <laughs> this yeah. No. Just get, get them up here. We, we wave them like, <laughs> like my kids say, like you just don't care. Um, because what we don't do, you know, we run, we cycle, we're on our phones, we're at our computers. Everything is here. Nothing goes above. Now, as swimmers, the triathletes, we're a step ahead of you cyclists and runners. <laughs> um, but even still, you know, just getting your arms up and moving. When we reach for things, we always reach in front as well. You yeah. know, if you want something out of a kitchen cupboard, you turn and go here. Yeah. You don't go there. You and so it's straight away when someone, if you're trying to get someone to work on overhead work, it's very, the rule of thumb is get the bar or the stick on the crown of your head and then push it straight up. And a lot of people are like, oh, and what happens is they overcompensate with the lower back and the thoracic spine and they aren't able to get their arms in that extension because this is all pulling them in. So again, yeah. very, very simple thing. Get the tennis ball in around that area, be a little bit global with it. People yeah. like to think that, and, and I was always of this kind of opinion when I was, I, I responded to, I was a good responder to aggressive treatment, I was told. So you, you're a very good responder to aggressive treatment. <laughs> like, I would go on holiday and get a massage at, at the spa and I'd be like, this person's just tickling me. I'm so used to having elbows and, you know, and thumbs yeah. and trigger point work. And, and, I, and I can say that that works tremendously. It's, it's, you're never going to get the same kind of um, effect from doing it manually or using a tool. Yeah because you're always going to kind of shy away a little bit if you are going too deep on it. That's where a therapist like yourself can say, like, listen, just breathe. It's going to be five seconds. I'm just going to do this. And they're like, mm -hmm. but then five seconds passes. There's a bit more range of movement. Things start loosening off. And then you start seeing the, the, the plasticity within the muscle and the, and the joint to really, really help. Yeah. Although all these tools are really, really great, if and when you get a chance to get therapy started again and get one on one and manual help from people, it's one of the best investments that I would say ever you, you, you could ever do. Uh, I used to get, I used to, well, I used to come and see you uh, yeah. for like sometimes twice a week, depending on what kind of load I was doing. And, and I found that is, uh, it's great if you can get the time to do that. If you're a full-time athlete, there's no reason why you can't. It should be probably part of your, your, your routine, your weekly routine, get a checkup okay. at least once, maybe twice a week if you can. Sorry, every, every two weeks. But the, the, the thing is, is that people, first of all, the, they'll be quite shy about jamming a, a, a ball, a tennis ball into their, their, their glutes or an area in case they think they're going to do any damage. Yeah. It's a pretty limited chance of that happening, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say the, the rule of thumb, now this isn't true for everybody. Remember, if you do have a proper injury, it'll be slightly different. But if you've just got something that's feeling a bit tight, a bit niggly, go in gently. You know, you respond really well to that kind of hardcore, you know, the treatment that I come out and I think, well, I hope the next guy that comes in doesn't need that too. Um, <laughs> some bodies respond, you know, everybody's body is different and responds differently. Um, and if you're a little bit concerned that you could do damage, one, reach out to me on one of the social media channels. Although I'm not technically, I'm not physically in a premise working, I'm still here to help and more than happy to offer advice. But don't be scared. Trust your own instincts. You know, if you do something and it feels that it's not right, then maybe it's not right. Move the tennis ball somewhere else where it's not quite so sharp. 
Yeah. You know, when we look, you know, if you look again, um, if we talk about the glutes, we've got the sciatic nerve in the glutes. Yeah. Now, if you manage to press deep enough to press a tissue that presses on the nerve, that's going to smart. Yeah. And if it smarts, just move a little. Yeah. So you can still working on the area that's sore, but it's not intensely sore. You know, I would say if it's, if it's really sharp, then it's too much, unless your aim is something more aggressive like you do. Mm. You know, so don't be scared of a niggle. And don't think that a niggle means you need to stop. Mm. Yeah. No, this, this is often a, a thing with people. They think that, oh, my, my back's sore. I was gardening yesterday. I don't garden, by the way, but a lot of people do. I was gardening yesterday and see my lower back. Oof, I've really done something. No, you've just been in a different position for a prolonged time, possibly. Now, some people will have hurt themselves, but most people, you're just a bit stiff. My best advice would be to get out for a walk, mm -hmm. a brisk walk, or lie on your back, bend your knees so your feet are on the floor and roll your knees side to side. Yep. I would also say that's a great exercise if you've got tight shoulders. Yeah, because you're, yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, because we're here. Now the lats, I'm going to stand up a little bit. The lats start from down here and they come up. One of, just one of the muscles that's attached to the shoulder blades. We need to move all of it. Yeah. You know, again, the body just likes to move. If you're feeling a little niggle, move. One of the one of the things that I do, I, I do that exactly. But what also I'll do is I'll pull my knees to my chest and I'll actually roll forward and roll back like I'm having a a, a mental episode in my living room. Floor. <laughs> and the pressure from the floor actually helps my side because these are big, big chains of muscles we've got in the back, and it's a huge kinetic chain, and that actually helps to address a lot of the tightness, and it actually helps to kind of just roll those tissues out instead of having on that roller which can be a little bit finicky on the foam roller sometimes i find yeah. usually it's way more work to actually get yourself in a position and manually move yourself up and down and then something else starts to hurt <laughs> your neck and it's like oh but yeah i think that's the main thing is that we know that the the, the humble tennis ball has got a, a massive uh, can have a massive effect on recovery and it helps as well in these niggles another thing that kind of has been coming up quite a lot recently carol is that people have been pinging messages and, and I'm sure there's people who are watching this who've maybe came across this just recently is that we're doing an awful lot of stuff indoors. Mm -hmm. This is mainly for the cyclists. We'll come on to the runners and, and pre and post in a, in a moment or two, uh, post exercise and, and pre-exercise stuff we can do to help with this. But it's niggly knees because we're on turbo trainers and we're in static positions and we've not got the same kind of environmental physics needed to hold ourselves up on a bike. You find a lot of people now are coming out with my, my knee's a little bit niggly uh, and uh, I'm not feeling too good. And uh, when I do high power efforts on the turbo trainer, I'm feeling it's really, really sore. What would be the rationale behind that, Carolyn? How can we use even the humble tennis ball to help fix that? So that's a really common complaint, should I say, or a common niggle that comes into the clinic every spring. Yeah, because the cyclists, the triathletes, even people that just like to keep really active, they've been inside on their turbo trainers or on their walk bikes all winter. Yeah. In that static position, mainly seated. We don't tend to do so much out of the saddle when we're, you know, we're usually crying in the saddle. Um, so that's quite, it's a really common niggle. So one of the things I would say is when you're static on the bike, you can physically look at your leg position. You know, when I'm out on the roads, I've got to be looking at the road. <laughs> um, it could be that the, the leg that has the sore knee, it's maybe turned out slightly. It's maybe turned in slightly. You know, it could be in a good position. It could be your, you know, and I wouldn't be able to help this, but it could be that the, your shoe needs adjusted slightly for indoors because outside is a different story. Yeah. And again, we come back to the glutes. So I would, for me, if I felt a niggle coming on in my knee, things that I would do are, first of all, stretch my quads, test my, my, my quad stretching, um, give my hamstrings a little stretch. Now, 
we don't need, I think stretching is important, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, it's important so that you can achieve your goal. So, you know, if you're a cyclist, you don't need to be able to do the splits, unless of course you're you, James. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, you don't need to be able to do that, but what you do need is you need the muscles to be in a good length for the range of movement that you need them to work at. And they can get tight. Um, and when we start to get niggles, that would be a place that I would look. Um, I would also do band work. So back to these kind of frog walks before I get on the bike. They're really, I would do them anyway. Yeah. Yeah, all the time. And a lot of the things that, that we do when we've got niggles, are things that we should do all the time. Yeah? I mean, how often? Well, I had this sore knee and I did these exercises and it felt great, but my sore knees come back again. Yeah? So another thing I would do, single leg squats. Okay. In front of a mirror. Now, they don't need to be pistol squats. Yeah? They just need to be checking that your knee's tracking well that there's a good balance of evenness in the muscles, you know, because if, if your position isn't quite right, you know, we've got four quad muscles, yeah? Not all four work exactly the same all the time. So by doing a single leg squat, you can challenge that and you can maybe see where your knee rolls in, you know, your leg rolls in or rolls out. You want it to go over your toes, yeah, these would be simple things to do a few of before you get on the bike. And, and that's a, a very good point there, Carol, is that the, the mirror, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of mirrors in gyms because I think that people tend to just look at themselves more than that. <laughs> but we have got one mirror in the gym that we move around just if people are doing specific correctional stuff. Yeah. That single legged movement that people don't realise how much knees track valgus and veris in and out ultimately depending on the load and at what point they're doing it and in the movement. And you'll also see that they'll do a bit of squirming around because the body's very good at finding a, a path of least resistance. So yeah. and adapt maybe in the hip or it'll maybe make you lean forward in a certain angle. Ultimately, what you're looking for in a single legged squat, it could be literally on a bar stool or it could be on like a, a normal chair in the living room or on the couch, even if your couch is relatively high, a, a dinner, t a dinner uh, table from your, uh, a, a, a chair from your, your dinner table. But literally making sure that the, your knee is aligned, that inside your kneecap is kind of running in, in line with your, your second toe. So that ultimately you're making this nice chain of smooth movement and that your knee's not dropping in. If your knee is dropping in, that's a real big sign that you're lacking that control. Not necessarily glute strength, but you're lacking glute control. And it's two very, very different things. If your glutes weren't firing, you wouldn't be standing up in the first place. Absolutely, yeah. Exactly. So yeah. it's just thinking about tracking of what it should look like so you should be able to almost draw a line from the kind of the middle of your your hip bone kind of through your kneecap through your second toe and you're if and doubt push your knee out so if you're doing your right leg push your knee out more to the right so you're getting a bit more push through that glute the worst thing you can do when you're doing a single legged movement or any kind of individual movement is um in, in the bottom half of your body is when your knee drops in because that's going to uh, create a huge chain of reverberative you know issues all the way up that chain and that then leads to hip, back, neck, whatever happens. And if you're loaded and you do that wrong, you ain't going to be. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. a lot of it as well is when you actually use that mirror, you can get a, a kind of good mind, you know, body connection and see what it looks like and see what it feels like. Because sometimes you just do things and you don't see what it looks like. And you're like, oh, I'm doing that fine. But then yeah. like, what are you doing? And it's like, what do you mean? So having that mirror in front of you is, or even just filming yourself on your, your phone or an iPad, it's really, really good way of doing it. But that's great. So that's then, we're then leading on to kind of the last sort of thing we want to talk about is that, so we're obviously, we spoke about recovery tools. We spoke about now how to bring some of those interventions in pre and post. We're now kind of addressed like the common issues just now with people who are training indoors. Runners will, will have a better handle on injury prevention because obviously it's an impact sport. And they're so they're better at being in this sort of this prehab sort of stuff, and and they're more kind of akin to doing a warm up. Whereas, yeah. say, we jump on the turbo trainer, or we jump on our bike, and we just pedal for ten minutes, and then we boost into our session. Before we actually jump on the bike, what sort of stuff you kind of alluded to earlier? What are the simple things that we can do? Is it literally just looking at doing um, 
you know, uh, some dynamic stretching? Is it looking at doing any mobilization? Is it looking at doing any foam rolling? Is it looking at then doing walks, monster walks, lateral walks? And of course, this will change for other different disciplines. If you're doing downhill mountain bike, you have to, you know, get your shoulders firing and get all that working. So press ups and band tear apart and all that sort of stuff, which is a whole other conversation. But yeah. purely now just looking at, you know, normal, just going out for a bike ride or doing an indoor session, what sort of stuff would you recommend that they would do as part of that warm up? And it's maybe five, and it can be literally five minutes and it will actually make the quality of your session a lot better. What sort of things would you recommend? Yeah. And I think that's important that it should be short because it's, if it's too long, you're not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest, you know, even, even in these days where most of us are, are at home, we're still thinking, I've got an hour or, yeah. So it's got to be short, it's got to be effective. My general rule of thumb would be, think about the movement that you're going to be doing. So on the bike, obviously the, the hips are moving, the knees are moving, you know, the feet are moving, we're in this position. Now, because we're going to be in this position, personally, I would be waving my hands and no, I'd be, you know, circle your arms, don't forget about the upper body. You want to mobilize that because it's going to be stuck mm -hmm. in one position for quite a while. So be nice to it. Say, I know we're going to be here, but, you know, mo so mobilize the, the upper body, move about. Walking lunges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're just activating that kind of pattern that you're going to do on the bike, but it's not exactly, but it's warming those muscles up. And then the band work that we've talked about. Um, with doing the lunges though, that's another thing where that leads on. That's probably a bit more advanced. So what you could do is you could do single legged squats to get the movement right. Because if you're not single legged squatting with good technique and good good linear yeah. a lunge, which is obviously a bit more dynamic, depending on how big a stride you take, but obviously a little bit less is better than too much. Mm -hmm. If your knee's not tracking right and your knee is falling in, that's potentially going to be something which would uh, lead down the road of mm -hmm have an issue and maybe make, aggravating that knee before you've even jumped on your bike but the banded stuff again literally little loop band around your knees or around your, around your feet actually I, I do one around the loop around my foot so it's going to be yeah. my foot and under my arch and doing sideways walking keeping the tension in the band and obviously 10 left 10 right have a wee break 10 left 10 right wrap it around your knees and then do forward and back walking trying to keep your, your feet straight when you're doing it yeah. Which is obviously trying to make sure that we're aiming to, when we're walking backwards, pop our heel out a little bit. So we're actually pushing with the glute out, all of the glutes, not just one of the glutes. Which you Yeah, I tend to zigzag when I go back. You're zigzagging back. So not a lunge, but a wide step to the side so that you are doing that activation. You could take it a step, you could take it a step back again and make it even simpler and just walk on the spot with high knees yeah yeah and maybe swing your leg a little bit mm -hmm. you yeah. know like be more likely to do that if I was running but you know and lifting your leg up and taking it out to the side so just opening up the hip yeah you know? I know on the bike we don't do that but it just gets the muscles what you're trying to do before you, you get on the, the bike and what you would possibly do, you know, pre-event or, or, or pre-training is you want to get the muscle pump flowing, which is what helps to, you know, the muscles help to pump all the lymphatic fluid and the blood back up the body. So you want to get them moving. So marching on the spot with high knees, kicking back, side little simple things just to loosen off before you get on the bike. The other thing, there's, there's another theory behind that. It's called PAP, which is post-activation potentiation, which means that you're, if you're going to do like an explosive session, whether it's like a sprint session, doing things like that will actually help switch your body on and make it more ready and make it more receptive to you asking it to produce full force. Mm -hmm. but we can get into that in another conversation, which is getting quite sciencey, and some people will understand what that means, and some people are like, what the heck does that mean? But Ultimately, what it does is it, it, it establishes a firing pattern and tells your brain that you're getting ready to do some sort of explosive exercise. And then it carries that in its memory for a short period of time. And when you actually ask it to do that effort, it's actually like, well, I know what I'm doing. Whereas some people would find if they do a sprint, the first sprint's usually quite mince. 
and then they get better as they go. Well, that's exactly the same thing, but you're doing it before you jump on your bike. So you're actually getting that activation of and potentiating that muscle so it's ready to fire and it's ready to explode if and when it's asked. But that, that, again, that's another, we're, we're trying to say right now and just try and keep it really simple. The, the other thing that people often like to do is stretch before they get on the bike, before they go for a run. Now, if there's nothing wrong with stretching, but what you don't want to do is those static stretches that you hold. Mm, yeah. You know, so when I said the walking lunges, that was more of a kind of active stretch. So you're firing the muscles, but you're lengthening them just for a short period as you go through the motion. The static stretching is for the end. Yeah, and that there's lots of research that, that you can read on why we think that's better, you know, um, than doing static stretching before you, you get on the bike um, or go out. So I think that it's important to, to know what, when there's a place for the exercises, like we talked about, when do you use the tennis ball and the foam roller and how do you use them? You know, we're trying to warm the body up by activating it, like you said, with your fancy technical terms. <laughs> you know, we're trying to activate the body and get it ready to, to move yep. at the start. And at the end, we want to be kind to it. Yep. You know, the bits that are sore, loosen them off, you know, um, at the end. I mean, it doesn't have to be aggressive treatment, but if you do find something that's there, just try and be kind to it and slowly it'll kind of work its way through. And sometimes that can take a couple of days. And yeah. you, you want to do is smash something so badly that it ends up bruising or it gets really, really sore and it ends up two or three days before you go back to it. And you potentially, not doing more damage to it, but you're actually making the, the recovery rate a lot, a lot longer than it needs to be. Yeah. And I would say that for, you know, people that think they've maybe got a mild strain in a, in a muscle, people's instinct is to stretch it and quite often to aggressively stretch it or stretch it all the time. And I, actually, we, we will want to do that possibly, but we want to do that with a bit of strength work as well, generally. But if you do think you've got a tear, reach out. You know, if you do think you've got something more than a niggle, this, this isn't what this is for. This is just for general niggles. You know, it could be that you've slept funny and jumped on the bike and, the, you know, it's a, a catalog of things. But if you've got something a bit more, then do seek advice. Yeah. Um, so on that note, Carol, obviously you're, you're, you're part of the Meta team. Uh, people yeah. reach out to us on the website. We've got info at whatsyourmeta.com. Carol at whatsyourmeta.com. We'll link all this below in the description, but you've also got your own thing on Instagram, haven't you? So what's your... Uh, the Meta Treatment Room okay. on Instagram. We'll pop that in as well. Um, and feel free to ask me any questions. I'm happy to do uh, very rough looking videos of, of things to do to help, yeah. um, especially during this time where a lot of our bodies are under a lot of different strains from normal yeah you know so, i'm sitting a lot more than normal <laughs> yeah, i know i know and it's not even that it's if you even even if you get the kids about as well it's like sometimes you're leaning over and you're being lazy with lifting them up and you're moving things around and you're maybe a bit more manually intensive in different ranges of movement to what you're used to yeah. and the gardening point of view you spoke about earlier that's when things can just kind of start flaring up isn't it yeah and stress as well you know, for some people, this is quite a stressful time. Oh, well, absolutely. And we can't forget that that can have an impact on how your body feels. Yeah, totally. You know, those days when you know you've, you want to go out on your bike or you want to go for a run and actually you just don't really feel like it and you're feeling a bit heavy and a bit sluggish. Those are the days I would say make sure you do the thing you were going to do, at least part of it. Um, but stress can have a big impact on that. So be kind to yourself. Um, it's kind of ex described every day I had when as a professional cyclist. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you had so much treatment. It was a lot for this as well. <laughs> you know what they say. Uh, do as I say, not as I do. But Absolutely. Thanks, thanks tonight for uh, giving us your time. Uh, this is going out obviously tomorrow morning uh, at 12 o'clock. So everyone will know that because we'll be watching it. 
But um, thank you for your time. And again, some nice wee nuggets there just to continue that uh, story about recovery. Things will move on uh, from here. We've got some really good chats coming up in the next couple of weeks, as well as our weekly wo uh, lockdown workouts, which go out every Monday, and obviously our insights, which drops every Wednesday. So do please stay tuned to uh, our new uh, continually growing content now on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you like what we're doing, give it a wee click, give it a wee subscribe, and do all the usual things that YouTubers ask you to do, like click on the notification bell and give us love and thumbs up and all that sort of stuff. But Thank you once again for uh, being part of our knowledge series here on YouTube and we look forward to seeing you guys next Wednesday for Insights and then again next Friday for our next edition of The Knowledge. Carol, thank you very much for your time and have a great weekend. You too, thank you. See you later. Bye.